For this video, I'm gonna share my favorite trip of all time. I don't think there's anywhere in the world that can rival South Africa in terms of the sheer variety of adventures to take on. In this two week itinerary, I'll make sure you don't miss a thing. You'll go on a safari to encounter animals you'll never forget, tour the incredible coastal garden routes, and make the most of everything the Western Cape offers. There are no tour groups here, all independent travel. And while that may feel intimidating, trust me when I say it'll offer a more authentic experience and also at a price that's much more affordable than you would otherwise have to pay. Stick around, I'm gonna tell you where I picked up this large egg and why that was a more intense experience than getting charged by a lion. So with that said, let's get to it. First, I wanna share an overview of the itinerary. You'll fly into Johannesburg. After picking up a rental car, you'll dedicate four days to Safari Kruger National Park and take in the views and waterfalls along the famous Panorama Loop. Upon your return, you'll take a flight to Port Elizabeth. This is where you'll start a road trip with three days along the coastal garden route. From there, you'll continue driving all the way to Cape Town. Fortunately, there are a number of stops along the way. I'll share some unique experiences around Oatshorn, where to go wine tasting in Stellenbosch, and why the drive from Cape Town to the Cape of Good Hope is one of the most scenic in the world. This trip will then end with returning your rental car at the Cape Town airport and flying home. This itinerary features a fair amount of driving, and while it takes a little time to become comfortable with driving on the left side, it wasn't too bad and I was impressed with how well maintained the highways were. By sticking to your plan and traveling during the day, you should have a safe experience. This is also an accessible destination with a high concentration of English speakers along the route. Upon arriving in Johannesburg, pick up a rental car and head over to a nearby hotel. You'll probably want to take some time to relax after a long and exhausting flight. The next morning is when things start to get exciting. Four and a half hours to your east is Kruger National Park. It's one of the largest game preserves in all of Africa. Well in advance of your trip, make sure to purchase your park passes at the sandspark.org website. The website offers modestly priced yet comfortable accommodations in the park. I stayed at the Lataba Rest Camp for two nights and found it met my needs and was a great location. On my drive into the park, I immediately encountered a number of Plains game animals, such as impalas and antelopes. My excitement grew as I found myself driving right up along a giraffe and catching a glimpse of a rare rhino in the distance. The last thing to book on the park website is morning and evening tours. Rangers will take you out in a large open air vehicle. With flashlights in hand, everyone's on the search. The morning trip was the most exciting though, where we found a breeding pair of lions on the road. At one point, one even charged and roared at us. Needless to say, it's best to stay in the vehicle. Through the balance of the day, do your best to cover the most ground possible in your quest to see the famous Big Five animals. In addition to seeing the lions and rhino, I encountered herds of elephants and Cape Water buffaloes, leaving me one short, the elusive leopard. That was okay though, there were plenty of hippos, crocodiles, baboons, bushbucks, and kudos to see along the way. Animals aside, the park is beautiful in its own way. There's something freeing about being able to drive yourself at your own pace as you explore. You'll never know what's around the next turn. Between Kruger National Park and Johannesburg lies the not to be missed panorama route. Getting there will take about a three hour drive. Plan to start at the three Rundells viewpoints. This is South Africa's Grand Canyon. It's one of those places you might recognize, yet not be able to place. Further down the road, you'll find Burke's Luck Potholes. This is a remarkable environment that will have you scrambling between a number of unique viewpoints while waterfalls cascade around you. The most notable of which is a cylindrical pothole in the sandstone bedrock. From the crags above, you'll see a fascinating network of tunnels and tubes and interconnected whirling pools. Pinnacle Rock is also not to be missed. This 30 meter quartzite tower is fringed by dense forest and has a nearby platform with panoramic views. As for waterfalls, the key decision you'll need to make is how many to see. The Panorama Route offers more waterfalls than any other part in South Africa. Just to the west of the highway, make sure to stop over at the two pull-offs for Berlin and Lisbon Falls, 80 and 92 meters respectively. Just to the south of Grasgow, you'll find the Macmac Falls and the Gorge Lift Company that feature a number of adventure activities such as zip lining, forest walks, and a suspension bridge. Here's a map that features an overview of the attractions 
all can be found within 50 kilometers north of Graskop along R532. For the next day, plan to drive back to Johannesburg to catch a flight to Port Elizabeth. The schedule will also afford you some time to check out some of the nearby attractions. I elected to do something a little bit different though, and that was to tour the Cullinan Diamond Mines. This mine is famous for producing the largest rough diamond ever found and is featured in the Crown Jewels. As part of this experience, you'll be fitted with all the required protective equipment, including an emergency breathing system. You'll take a lengthy descent to a depth of 750 meters in the mine shaft. Afterwards, you'll have a chance to learn more about the mining operations and equipment. If you book, double check to make sure that this isn't a service tour. Port Elizabeth is where your next adventure starts. After you pick up a rental car in town, the first leg of the 750 kilometer drive to Cape Town is known as the Garden Route. This coastal drive will feature a number of stunning beaches, small towns to explore, and animal sanctuaries. I ended up choosing to stay in Plettenberg Bay for two nights where I had a great spot overlooking the beach. As for areas to explore, I recommend first stopping at Titsi Kama National Park. It features an incredibly picturesque suspension bridge along the ocean. The hiking was also amazing as you looked over small beach pockets made of beautiful golden sand. One of my favorite attractions were the Rock Hyraxes, or my preferred name, Dassies. These funny looking animals were the size of a cat, yet are most closely related to elephants. Just check out those tusks. If you're up for something extreme, stop by at the Blokrans Bridge. This 216 meter arch bridge is the tallest in Africa and the site of the world's highest commercial bridge bungee jumping. I've been bungee jumping before, but wasn't prepared to do something like this. I instead elected for a new experience with garden route gliding. For a very reasonable fee, I went up with a retired commercial pilot aboard his aerobatic plane. He demonstrated how to do barrel rolls, loops, and stalled turns, all before handing over the controls to me. This was an incredible experience to perform and feel the g-forces of these maneuvers, all while taking in the stunning coastal views. You can also reserve a flight on a glider if you're interested. In terms of beaches to explore, I highly recommend driving down to Nature's Valley Beach. I was there on a perfect day on an incredible beach and had the whole place to myself. This is also close to the popular Salt River Trail. Another great place to explore is the Rawberg National Preserve. I'd recommend planning your hike around the time of sunrise or sunset. While out there, you might even be lucky enough like I was to see a whale. Speaking of whales, the Garden Route offers some of the world's best places to go whale watching, especially between the months of July and November. You'll also have a number of animal parks in the area, including Birds of Eden, Monkey Land, and the Lawnwood Snake Sanctuary. I ended up visiting the Gneisa Elephant Park, where I was introduced to two rescued elephants. The encounter afforded me a chance to get close to feed and walk the elephants. The area also features a number of great restaurants, so make sure to make reservations in advance. The Fat Fish restaurant was delicious, and Restaurante Enrico offered some incredible views. At the start of your third day in the region, it'll be time to hit the road again. I recommend planning to stop in Nysa for an early lunch. The East Head Cafe is a great option as it offers spectacular views of the narrow passage of the headwaters entering into the lagoon from the ocean. You'll also have an option to stop over at the waterfront shopping mall in town. Just make sure you save enough time to finish the 90 minute drive to Otsorn with a few hours of daylight to spare. As you pull away from the coast, prepare for the landscape to dramatically change over the coming days. Otsorn is known as the ostrich capital of the world, and before wrapping up the day, you must find a farm to tour. I visited the Highgate Farm, where I had an opportunity to see baby chicks, feed, or as my guide called it, get a neck massage, and see a race. But my experience did not end there. I was also the only volunteer on the tour group that signed up to ride an ostrich. Lean back and hook your feet to the front. This was a wild experience and just a little bit terrifying. <laughs> 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 
plan for two nights in the Otsorn area to get away from it all. Ideally at a place that has only a handful of guests and offers resort-type experiences. I stayed along a local river in a private bungalow for a very modest price. One of the major highlights for me was making friends with the resident meerkat, Timon. He would venture out from his pack, and we became close friends in the coming days. It was such a fun experience. Upon checking out, prepare for the longest drive of the trip, five and a half hours. Along the way, I recommend visiting the Kango Caves. This is one of the largest show caves in the world and the oldest tourist attraction in the country. You probably only need an hour for your visit. Next, you'll traverse the Schwarzberg Pass. While unpaved, it doesn't require a 4x4 unless the weather is bad. Plan for two hours for this road as it slices through magnificently scenic geological formations, including the spectacular Wall of Fire cliff face. Once you're through on the other side, you'll now be in the high desert area known as the Great Karoo. I recommend stopping over in the small town of Prince Albert for a late lunch. If you enjoy wine tasting, you'll love your time in Stellenbosch. This town features a number of well-appointed hotels in a very walkable area. This region produces some internationally recognized wines and even features its own unique varietal, Pinotage. First cultivated in 1925, it is a cross between a Pinot Noir and a Sinault. I suggest scheduling a wine tasting tour for your first day. I booked a private guide through Camino Tours and had a great experience. Some wineries I recommend visiting include De Trafford, Anthony Rupert, and the Waterford Estate. As for dining, the Dulaire Graff restaurant was an incredible experience. Other options to check out include the Jordan Restaurant and the Klein Zeiss Wine Estate. You should also consider an excursion out to Franschuk. This town is surrounded by mountains and features a walkable street with shops, art galleries, and cafes. This region also has a number of farmer's markets if you happen to be there over the weekend. If wine isn't your thing, you could also take a day to drive down to Gansby. This is the go-to destination to go cage diving with great white sharks. Your last three days of the trip will be based out of Cape Town. I ended up booking an Airbnb with a view of Table Mountain and Lion's Head. I think it is one of the most incredible city views in the world. First, I recommend checking the forecast for your clearest day. This is when you're going to want to grab your jacket and prioritize visiting the 1,085 meter high Table Mountain. While I took the cable car up and down, the two hour hike is also quite popular. Once you're at the top, you'll be amazed at how flat the terrain is. Take time to walk around the ledge and experience all the different viewpoints. This area also features some very interesting flora and fauna. For the second half of the day, visit the Kirstenbosch National Botanic Garden. I would argue that this is one of the best botanical gardens in the world and not to be missed. It features a hillside garden and nature reserve with rare plant species, walking trails, and mountain views. One of the highlights is the iconic Boomslang Canopy Walkway. Within the city, the VNA waterfront is a major tourist attraction. It features a huge shopping and entertainment area along the harbor. While I took the time to check it out, I think you'd be fine if you skipped it. Unless you plan to go out on the water, check out the Ferris wheel, or visit the aquarium. You should, however, visit the nearby Signal Hill. This flat-topped hill offers some views of Table Mountain, the city, and ocean that would be a great spot for a sunset picnic. Also make sure to take a picture inside the iconic yellow frame. One popular daytime destination is the Hillside Bokop neighborhood. It is known for its narrow cobbled streets lined with colorful houses. Local Malay culture is represented at sites like the 1790s built Awal Mosque and the Bokop Museum. Set aside a full day to explore the Cape Peninsula. It's a great way to bookend an incredible trip. Start early at Boulders Beach in the eastern side to beat the crowds. In this area, you'll be able to walk a series of boardwalks where you'll be immersed by a colony of African penguins. They're so fun to watch as they work their way from the ocean and swim with the rise and fall of the waves. If that wasn't fun enough, they also sound like donkeys and are appropriately named jackass penguins. From there, continue south along the coast. I pulled over to explore the area around the Buffalo's Bay Beach and ended up with a few of my favorite panoramic pictures. At the southern tip, you'll find the Cape Point Nature Preserve. This area features a number of attractions, including a funicular that will take you to the lookout at the Cape of Good Hope Old Lighthouse. 
From there, you'll have an option to drive to or hike along the coast to the furthest southwest point of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope. As you return along the western coast, note that part of the drive was the only toll road that I encountered on the trip, but well worth it. This may have been the most scenic drive I've ever taken. Once you've arrived at Camps Bay, you'll be surrounded by some of the world's most famous beaches. Take some time to enjoy the area and go for a swim if it isn't too cold. You'll find a relaxed environment with soft white sands, boulders, food vendors, and chair rentals. If you have extra time or want to prioritize learning more about South Africa's apartheid history, you can take a boat out to Robben Island to see where Nelson Mandela was held in captivity. It takes about five hours and has three departures each day. Another option is to visit one of the surrounding townships. For security reasons, it's highly recommended that you book with a tour operator rather than going independently. Settling on a type to visit can be tricky given the variety of locations. Fortunately, there really isn't a bad time to visit. It's more about what's important to you. Kruger is the warmest part of this itinerary. If you want to avoid summer by traveling between May and October, your risk for malaria decreases, likelihood of rainfalls, and the lack of foliage will make the animals easier to see. Conversely, during these months, Cape Town will see cooler weather, which isn't great if you plan to spend time on the beach. Weighing these options, I suggest visiting in May, September, or October. You'll also miss the European summer tourist crowds. Purchasing power for foreigners is quite high, especially if they travel independently. I recommend provisioning between $4,500 and $6,600 for two people over two weeks with well-appointed accommodations and full-service dining experiences. While I generally forego it, a traveler's insurance policy may be worth exploring. Let me know in the comments if you've been to South Africa. I'd love to hear what you thought about it and if I've missed anything on this video. Make sure to check out my other videos on where to go next. If you found this video to be helpful, please like and subscribe. Well, I'm sure this could be your perfect trip. Stay tuned to see what's next.